what if you woke and found yourself somewhere nowhere you weren't understood and didn't understand others the creature comforts that surround you were now gone and the convenience of your tesco delivery gone your nearest neighbor is a mile away and most of your current skill set is redundant and a whole new skill set was needed overnight the way you live work and relax totally changed how would you cope now look it's not that bad i mean those things are real but uh, let's say you had three months to prepare for such an eventuality what would you do what needs to change this is what i'd like to explore in the next 15 16 minutes or so and uh, take you through a compressed version of my thoughts on this and uh, on our lifestyle and share some stories on how we uh, or I survived. So first of all, let's talk about Latvia. So myself, my wife Gita and daughter live here in Latvia. In the, in Latvia is a, the central Baltic state. It sits below Estonia and above Lithuania. Its main language is Latvian, which together with Lithuanian is one of the oldest European languages. And um, it's one of the hardest to learn as well. Uh, Latvia is 52% forested and uh, wood is the main business here. Despite that, Latvia is one of the few countries in the world that is seeing afforestation occur. Now, temperatures can go down to minus 30 in the winter and up to about plus 35 in the summer. I've experienced both. Just last week, it was minus 28 centigrade. We have proper seasons here. We live in a house in the middle of a forest. And um, at the end of a single lane dirt track. And to get to us, you have to cross a rickety old sluice gate bridge over the lake. We have 150 acres of forest, which we manage. And of that, five acres is used as a small holding. And on that, we have our homestead or whatever you uh, want to call it. And we do as we please. We're fully reliant on wood for our heating and some of the cooking. Wood needs to be brought into the house every few days, regardless of the weather. There's no central heating. Fires have to be lit individually, but they are an internal type fire with a heat uh, where a mass uh, then radiates the heat for the next 24 hours. This is the uh, wood fired stove in the kitchen, which actually heats two or three rooms. And it's also got an oven as well. But it works. It might be old, but it works. And we're cozy warm, even in the coldest nights. The house is totally livable in and compared to a lot of accommodation here in Latvia might be considered um, very luxury, uh, luxurious. But there's a lot of renovation needed. Uh, we replaced the roof of the house just last year and we'll slowly work through the rest as necessity uh, dictates to us and budgets allow. But why are we here? Well, in 2018, Gita, together with our then four-year-old daughter, came to visit her father on a routine trip. During that time, Gita's father fell and broke his hip and he needed surgery. He had a low chance of survival and we were told it wouldn't be long. Gita extended her stay for what we thought would be a short while. Days turned to weeks and weeks turned to months as she continued to care for him. There's little to no supported care provision here in Latvia, so family members have to do it themselves. It became clear that the it wouldn't be long had in fact become long and we had to consider the future as I was still in the UK on my own. So we chose to pack up, move out and start afresh here. It was actually an easy decision, but no less gut wrenching. We've now been here two years and we've lived to tell the tale. I've learned a lot and I've lived a lot and I've lost a lot, mostly weight. So that's positive. Anyway, here's the eight things I've learned that have helped me and would maybe help you to live somewhere nowhere. Item one, how to learn everything from YouTube. What do you need to know to live somewhere nowhere? Well, you don't know what you don't know. And sometimes you don't know what you need to know. I did know what I'm likely to need to know 
and that was around the general subject matter of how to grow food, how to live self-sufficiently, how to live remotely, etc. So what was my approach? Well, a sit down, a good cup of tea, a biscuit and a YouTube. Now, YouTube to me up to that point uh, was an escape mechanism, a tool to chill out of a Friday night when I can grab a, a beer, sit down, load up YouTube and go down a rabbit hole that starts with something informative but interesting and it ends up uh, with a video with some guys throwing dry ice into a swimming pool just to see what happens. That changed that night when I searched living on a homestead. Suddenly there was a way to learn, to watch hours of other people's experiences and to saturate yourself in the wisdom and factual knowledge available. Homesteading led to gardening, and gardening led to farming, etc, etc. Now, um, there's a scene in a film called The Matrix, that uh, maybe you know of it, where the character Trinity suddenly needs to fly a helicopter. She dials up the operator and she asks for an info patch, which is downloaded to enable her to fly. It strangely feels a bit like that, only spread over, you know, a few months you'll find that there is an equal value in watching positive successes as much as there is from watching failure. Learning from other people's mistakes is very powerful. I took the view that if I had this opportunity to start from scratch, then I wanted to replicate um, what the pros do, treat it like a business, only my customers were my family. So I tried to focus on modern market garden farming techniques we're not a farm and maybe we never will be but if that opportunity arises all i need to do really is to upscale but be warned um, there's also a lot of dross on youtube you need to filter out and seek out wisdom so number two the wisdom filter do you know the difference between wisdom and knowledge knowledge is knowing that a tomato is a fruit and wisdom is knowing not to put it into a fruit salad you need to run stuff through the wisdom filter. And to do that, you need to ask why. Why should I do that? Why do you do that? Be a child and ask why, why, why? Because if the person you're asking doesn't know why they're doing what they're doing, or they're doing it because they've always done it that way, or their father and their mother has always done it that way, you probably need to check it. Because in many respects, the world has moved on. Let me give you an example. The field that we grow most of our veg in has been ploughed year after year. It's only a small field, like I say, we're not a farm. Once in the autumn and then once in the spring. And when I asked, why do we plough the field? No one could tell me why. They just always had. And when I nearly did my back in, battling the weeds the first year, and that's a perfectly acceptable practice here, I'm at, I researched it and I discovered that ploughing brings weeds to the surface. Nature doesn't plough in order to grow abundantly, so why should we, in our context? In fact, this led me to discover the no-till or no-dig methodology, which has revolutionised the way that we grow food here. It's increased our potential yield from the same space by about threefold, and it's half as much work. This is the new garden. You can see the transformation. 30 or so permanent beds with wood chip paths. Number three. Learn to live on Apollo 13. It's hammered into us to be proactive, work smarter, not harder, fail to plan, plan to fail, etc., etc. And they're all good wisdoms, don't get me wrong. But we've eroded the skills to be reactive. You need to relearn to be reactive in this situation, to think on your feet. There's no Amazon next day delivery here to solve your problem with something new. You have to repair and reuse. You see, we need to live in readiness that every day will be like you on Apollo 13. We all know the story of Apollo 13, the mission that went so very wrong, yet the astronauts, thanks to some reactive thinking, all returned safely to home. The team at Mission Control had to find a way to remove carbon dioxide from the space module, or the astronauts would suffocate. They famously threw a box of bits onto the table that represented all the items the astronauts had in space. And then they came up with a solution to solve the problem. Most weeks, somewhere, nowhere, it will feel like you're that team at Mission Control with a box of bits and somehow you need to solve a problem quickly, 
like a 10 month old broken shelf that suddenly needs fixing right now or an unexpected broken well pump or capturing an escaped pig. All real examples. Item four, change your heart and your mind. George Bernard Shaw, the Irish playwright said this, progress is impossible without change. And those who cannot change their minds cannot change anything. Anyone who moves to another country or culture has to take a long shower to rid themselves of the patterns of thought from where they are. I might call it de-westernizing. And it's a great thing to do. The sooner you shake off, the sooner you'll achieve things where you are now. Number five, welcome to the barter economy. Throw money at it is often the answer. It's a Westerner's answer, perhaps, and okay in a city, maybe that is the answer but we're not in the city, we're somewhere nowhere. We frequently give away jars of honey from our own hives to people that help us. The man that snow plowed our road just last week got one. A thank you isn't anything new, of course, but a jar of your own precious honey has far more value than that, uh, the monetary equivalent. In the country, it's totally acceptable to trade with what you have for what you don't have. A big jar of honey for a pail of raw milk, for example. A Red Cross parcel of British goodies in exchange for me baking a sourdough loaf. And we will grow extra vegetables in case we need to barter with those as well. Number six, build trust. I am the only person in the village. Uh, sorry, I'm the only English person in the village. And being that it's a small village, most folk would know that there's an Englishman in the village now. Jungle drums bang fast and loud. It's most likely if you move abroad to somewhere nowhere, you too will become the sole ambassador of your nation. There's a natural air of suspicion. Why is he here? What does he want? Isn't England better? There's a lady who works in the shop in, in the village. None of the shop assistants to my knowledge speak uh, English and that's fine. But there's one lady who one day said to me in a very strong accent after some time that I'd been here and she got to know who I was. Hello, my friend. And then she laughed and I laughed too. Each time I now see her and I say to her, hello, my friend, and we laugh. I assume she tells everyone else the same anecdote and they laugh too. It's the village shop. It's a community hub where positive stories, hopefully about the English guy can spread from. You, you never know uh, when you're somewhere nowhere, uh, when you might need someone and uh, from the village with a particular skill. And these things help out to build trust. Number seven, do crazy stuff. There will be many things that you can no longer do. Just get over it. However, you will have the opportunity to do things that you never could before. Things that perhaps no one you, um, no one that you know has done before. Not things that cost a lot, but just new things because your new situation allows you to do so. In 2019, our first full year here, in fact, we'd only been here six months, we got two pigs. I do not know what we were thinking. Our only animals we'd kept were two hamsters. I mean, it was crazy. We said to ourselves, we're mad. We spoke to friends and they said, you're mad. We even spoke to the local DEFRA equivalent officer. And they said, we were mad. That was their actual words on a telephone call. Anyway, we raised these two pigs for me and we sold one to a neighbor and that paid for both. The entrepreneurial spirit in me still hasn't been lost. We called on that school of YouTube and it worked. We successfully raised the two pigs and we processed them ourselves. Yes, it was an ordeal with its highs and lows. And on reflection, it was crazy, but it was a good experience. It was positive and it was a step towards that self-sufficiency goal. Now, that escaped pig that I mentioned earlier. On the eve of the one bad day, um, I went out of the house to close up the barn and I was open and I opened the front door to go out. This is the view from the front door, that's our yard. And there in the middle of the yard was this 150 kilogram pig just rooting around doing things that pigs like to do. I had to blink, I couldn't believe my eyes. And then I shouted, Gita, there's a pig in the yard. It was a pig. It was the pig we were supposed to be delivering to our neighbor the next day. Oops. 
and all I saw was 400 euros of bacon escaping into the forest. We ran out and all we could do was coax it back into the barn with food. In the end, I grabbed the rope and made a harness to help, um, but it still took an hour to move the pig about 30 meters back into the barn. It was like a scene from The Good Life, or some mothers do have them. Our daughter has learned to ice skate this year. And we live next to a lake and it froze, so there's the perfect rink. It's easy to look out the window and say, oh, look, a frozen lake, that's pretty. But something crazy might be to go and skate on it or walk across it. Or as I did last year, throw stones across it and record the resulting sound, which resonates the frequency of the lake ice and is quite beautiful. And also I went on a sledge this year for the first time in probably 40 years. That's me bombing down the hill there. Number eight, share your wisdom. I started a YouTube channel to show friends and family back in the UK what it was that we were doing. As things went along and I started applying the new skills and knowledge I had obtained into our context, it made for new knowledge and experiences that could be shared with the world. And so the YouTube channel was taken on a new role. And in some way, I feel that I can pay back into that pool of free knowledge for others to enjoy and learn from. So there we are, my eight thoughts on living and surviving somewhere nowhere. It's by no means exhaustive and there are many more experiences and stories to share. Is it a good life? I don't know, but it's certainly a different life for sure.